call me. My contact will be at the end. Um, I also take one-on-one -on -one meetings. So there's lots of different ways to connect with me if you guys have questions beyond this session as well. So as we get into it, I do want to acknowledge the fact that I'm a visitor here in the Treaty 7 territory. I'm from Loon River First Nation in Treaty 8. Um, it's a Creek community, pretty small. There's only about 500 people that are from there or members of that community. Um, but for the last 10 years, I've been lucky to call Treaty 7 home. Um, Treaty 7 is home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is which comprises of the Siksika, Bigani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Wesley First Nations. Calgary or Mokinstis is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. This is not only important for me to acknowledge as a visitor, but it's also an important piece of the University of Calgary's Indigenous strategy, it's Apatope, which is working to um, indigenize our campus, so it's not just confined in a box of the Writing Symbols Lodge or our Native, our native Center. If you're looking for written versions of what I'm going to be talking about today, you can scan the QR code on the left. This is our domestic view book. Um, it's going to talk all the generic info about the University of Calgary. And the one on the right is specifically for Indigenous students. It talks about our Indigenous supports, pathways, scholarships, the Writing Symbols Lodge, anything Indigenous related happening on campus. And Camila is also going to put in the chat a link if you want physical copies of our view books mailed to you. If you're not from Alberta, there's a couple facts that I think it's important that you know. Um, we, first of all, have no provincial sales tax. This is exciting for students because typically it makes uh, Calgary and Alberta more affordable throughout your student time. We're also the fourth largest population in Canada, so we're not as big as BC or as Ontario, and if that's something that you're looking for, a more medium-sized urban setting, Calgary might be perfect for you. Beyond that, we're home to five national parks. And with those national parks within them, you'll find lots of different stuff to do and lots of different stuff to see. In the northern portion of the province, we're lucky to have a piece of the boreal forest stretching across the north. In the east, you'll find a more desert-like landscape near Dinosaur Provincial Park in Drumheller. And then in the south, you're gonna find more prairie-like foothills um, near Lethbridge and also where you'll find head smashed in Buffalo Jump. And then in the West, you'll find the Rocky Mountains. So you can go skiing or snowboarding or go for a hike in the summer. Like I mentioned, we're lucky enough not to have PST in Alberta. And that contributes to the fact um, that Calgary is the number two lowest cost of living in Canada. So like I mentioned, very affordable for students. We're also the number one most livable city in North America. So what that, um, what makes that up is the fact that there's lots of stuff to do here. You can float the bow, you can take advantage of our vast uh, pathway network that stretches throughout and across the city. The Rocky Mountains are super accessible. You can go to uh, football or hockey games, or now we also have a soccer team you can check out, restaurants downtown. Um, beyond that, we are lucky to have 333 days of summer, sorry, days of sun every year. Um, this makes us Canada's sunniest major city. So even if it's, you know, snowing and cold in the winter, you're still going to be able to see the sun. You're still going to be able to get that serotonin boost every morning. Beyond that, we're also lucky to have Chinook winds just based on where we are beside the Rocky Mountains, which allows um, the temperature to be raised by up to 15 degrees in the winter. So it's not uncommon to have weeks where you don't have to carry on your drawing jacket, you can just have a light sweater. This next slide is going to introduce you to who the University of Calgary is when we were founded and some important stats that we like to share with students. First off, we were founded in 1966. This makes us about 55 years old or years young because when you compare us to other major universities in Canada, uh, that's actually pretty young. But in that time, we've managed to become the number six top research university in Canada. When I was in my first year, second year, probably even my third year of university, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what this meant for me. As a student, I was probably like, oh, it's my professor who's doing research. 
It's, you know, people trying to cure cancer. And that is happening on campus. Professors are doing research. Others are looking to cure cancer and big sciencey things like that. But research exists in any field of study that we have on campus. And it's also available for students to take part in in their first year, second year, third year of university. Um, maybe you have something that you really want to answer in research. We'll support you on your own to do that. And then you can also support professors that are doing research in their, in their fields of study. We've got about 28,000 students, undergraduate students on our campus. This is a big number. But ultimately, these are all people that you'll be able to reach out to for support. They're going to be people in your classes. They're going to be your friends. And in the future, they're going to be your colleagues. Or maybe they'll be lead researchers in their fields, and you'll be looking to them um, for support in other projects that you're working on. We are Canada's entrepreneurial university. Um, and we think this is really important because we understand that industries are changing, jobs are changing. Um, technology is constantly changing. So we want our graduates to be successful 10, 15, 20, 25 years after they graduate so that they're still able to be successful, pivot and adapt within their fields of study, fields of work, um, or even if they're looking to have an industry change, a career change. We also have a 94% graduate employment rate. This is exciting because it means over nine in 10 of our graduates end up with a job when they graduate. This is an aerial shot of our campus. If you've never been before, we've got about 490 acres of Park Lake campus. We do consider ourselves a walking campus. So between classes, between buildings, you will be walking. Um, if you look at the Olympic Oval in the top right portion of your screen to the atrium in the center left, that's about a seven minute walk. So it's pretty manageable between your classes. Um, I also like to talk about my favorite thing on our campus. It's that all of our main campus buildings, except for like two of them, are connected by plus 15s or tunnels. So if it's blizzarding in the winter or it's raining in the spring and the fall, you can walk through the indoors, not have to worry about carrying um, a big puppy jacket or an umbrella or anything like that. You can stay dry and stay warm. Beyond academics, it's really important that you take part in the student experience that goes beyond the classroom. So one of the ways we encourage students to do this is through student clubs. We have over 300 of them on campus and they range in different varieties. So maybe they're cultural clubs, maybe they're related to your faculty or what you're studying. Uh, maybe they're extracurricular related, maybe they're sports related, or maybe they kind of don't fit into a category and it's like a sandwich making club. There's lots of different options for you to take part in. And if you don't find one that suits your interest, but you have an idea for one alongside nine other students, you can go to the students union and they'll help you find a new club. Regardless of what school you go to, I stress this to students all the time, your access to recreation and fitness facilities are typically included in your student fees and tuition. So it's really important that you take advantage of that. And so at the University of Calgary, we do this through the Aquatic Center. Students have access to a Olympic sized swimming pool and um, the fitness center. It's just like a gym. There's also an indoor track the Gymnastics Center, the Olympic Oval, which is for skating. This was built for the 88 Olympics and it still continues to be nicknamed the fastest ice in the world because there are the most speed, speed skating records broken there. It's got something to do with the elevation, the roof. I don't know what it is, but it makes them go very fast. We've also got the Racket Center. You can book courts in if you're interested in playing squash or racquetball. And then the Outdoor Center, it's the largest of its kind in North America. Students every semester get a certificate um, to use so that they can rent equipment through them. And then they also get a discount. And basically you can rent anything wilderness related through them. So maybe it's a kayak or a canoe, or maybe it's a backpack because um, you're planning to go backpacking or hiking poles or hiking boots. Basically anything you can rent from them. We also are home of the dinos. So we've got a variety of different varsity level sports teams that students can partake in or go and support them at different events. If you are looking to be an elite top tier athlete, you can go to godinos.com to connect with a coach 
um, in the sport that you're interested in to learn more about what their recruiting process is like. Some sports ask for film and stats. Some come out to games to see um, just what kind of player you are before they you know, take you through the recruiting process. If you're not looking to be an elite level athlete, I know I wasn't in university, it's still a great way to get out in and experience um, student life. We host a variety of different bigger events every year. The ones I like to mention are kickoff. This is the first football game of the year. Um, it actually just happened a week ago. Students went out to McMahon Stadium and cheered on the Dinos and they won their first game of the season. We also do something called the Crochad Classic, which typically happens at the end of January. And it's where the U of C Dinos play the Mount Royal Cougars, which is another university here in Calgary. And we pack the saddle down. So it's where the Flames play. And we cheer on both the men's and women's hockey teams as they play against the Mount Royal Cougars. Study abroad is also an option while you're at the University of Calgary. This isn't something that typically happens in your first year, so you don't really have to worry about COVID right now, but in your second or third year, it might be something you want to experience. We've got uh, partnerships in 45 different countries, and so while you're there studying at one of those institutions, you're actually gaining credit for your UCalgary degree while you're abroad. Uh, you get to pay uh, UCalgary tuition and fees while you're abroad, so you're not playing um, the international premiums that some institutions charge. So we aim to have about 50% of students take part in an international experience. Uh, Camille, who's in the chat, actually got to take part in two while she was a student. She got to go to Singapore and then Italy as well. I've also had some friends go to Ghana, Scotland, and then they also did a study abroad in Vietnam as well. So there's lots of different opportunities for students to travel and study without putting school on the back burner. Work integrated learning is really important during your degree. It allows you to take those things that you're learning in lecture and actually apply them to real life scenarios, real life jobs. And it really gives you an edge once you, once you graduate um, and you're in your field of study working full time. So we do this through co-ops and internships, practicums, and then also paid research and other field experiences. Co-ops and internships are just like a job placement. The only difference between the two is the length of time. Uh, co-ops are typically eight to 12 months and internships are 12 to 16. And so typically in that time, students aren't studying or they're just taking night classes and they're working a full-time job to gain that experience. Practicums are required for nursing and education. They are optional in kinesiology. Practicums are also our only non-paid work integrated learning opportunity because it's really important and mandatory that you learn those skills before you become a nurse and before you become a teacher and you're actually in the field when you graduate. Um, but the benefit of practicums is typically those students that finish practicums end up with a job placement at those places when they finish. Paid research, although it mentions health science, community rehabilitation, and social work on the screen, is available in any faculty. Um, it doesn't just have to be science related. I was in the Haskane School of Business and studied, um, sorry, and took part in paid research when I was a student. So it's available anywhere if you look for it. There's lots of student supports on campus. These are all designed to make sure that your university experience is as seamless as possible and to make sure that you feel supported throughout your degree. So the ones that I wanna talk about particularly are career services. Uh, maybe you need some help boosting your resume or you have a big interview coming up and you wanna practice mock questions. They'll do all that with you. They also do one-on-one -on -one career advising. The Student Success Center is probably the most used student support on campus. I know I used a lot in my first year and my second year because coming out of high school, I really, I had written essays before, but I didn't know what writing a university level paper was like. I didn't know how to cite my sources or my research. And so it was really helpful to be able to book an appointment with them and have them go through my whole paper with me before I submitted it. The student wellness services are very advantageous for all students, but particularly particularly students that aren't from Calgary. So I like to uh, describe the University of Calgary as a city within a city. So what this means is that all those services like doctors and dentists and optometrists and therapists and counselors, all of those sorts of things are all located on our campus and our McEwen Student Center. So you don't have to drive across the city if you don't want to. 
I also want to talk about the Writing Symbols Lodge. This is our native center on campus. They have a whole staff of their own and their staff really wants to be there for Indigenous students from their first day of classes at orientation until they're graduating and hopefully participating in our Indigenous graduation. In between that time, you can hang out in the Writing Symbols Lodge. It's located in our main student hub on campus in Mac Hall, and you're able to hang out in their like lounge. It's got chairs and tables and sofas, a fridge, a sink, that kind of stuff for lunch. It's very popular at lunch. There's a smudge room, um, a computer lab, and then there's other spaces you can study in as well. And they also have academic, cultural, and personal advising available throughout the week for students to access if that's something that they need. They also do other programming, which includes cultural events, like um, there's an upcoming ribbon shirt and ribbon skirt workshop. They do language workshops, beading workshops, that kind of stuff. And then also Otap Imskan is run through the Writing Symbols Lodge, and it's a youth leadership program. And so students from U of C, um, Indigenous students, take part in this program, and they actually get to go out into community and work with other youth on building their leadership skills. Living on campus is an option, whether you live in Calgary and area or not. If you live in another place, obviously you're welcome to live on campus as well. We have a two year residence guarantee and there's options for both double and single rooms depending on what your preference is and what, what is available. We do require a meal plan for first year students living in residence. Our dining center is also open to any student on campus, whether or not you're living in residence. Our recruiting team actually went to the dining center probably about a month ago now it was my first time there. And I, I was really blown away by the variety of things that there were to eat. There was like a stir fry set up, burgers. There was like a pizza set up, a salad bar. Um, the dessert selection blew me away. I know our team kept going back for seconds and even thirds of that. There was other protein and vegetables available, a sandwich thing. This list just keeps going on and on. So it's not like you're just getting that one thing at the dining center every day. There's a variety every single day. There's lots of advantages to living on campus. You're close to your classes, your labs, study groups, all of those things. Also the fitness facilities that I talked about earlier. And then beyond that, it's a great way to build a community. They host lots of events for students to get to know each other, but also really just to get to know the campus and what university is like. When you're considering what program to go into, I just want you to be aware that the University of Calgary has over 250 programs and program combinations. So what this means is you can really customize your degree to suit what you wanna do. If I'm considering my own study, I completed a Bachelor of Education where I concentrated in organizational behavior and human resources. So already there, I wasn't just studying business, I looked at the psychology of business and human resources within my studies. And then I decided to add a minor where I studied international indigenous studies. So I even got more specific to what I wanted to do and what I wanna do in the future. And so for you, you can do that too. Select your major, your program. If you wanna add a minor, that's an option or an embedded certificate, or maybe you wanna do two degrees at once. It's also an option. We're gonna now talk about those specific programs. We've got eight faculties we'll be going through today that have undergraduate programs. And so the first one I wanna talk about is the Faculty of Arts. This is our largest faculty and lots of students kind of assume arts means like dance or music or drama. It expands beyond that. Although we have those programs, arts also includes things like law and society, anthropology, English, psychology, film, all of those things are in the Faculty of Arts. The Haskin School of Business, I'm a little biased towards this school. Um, it's where I studied organizational behavior and human resources. So if you're interested in business, quick plug, you should go forward with it. But there's lots of different options for you to study. Um, and even if you don't know what you're interested in exactly, maybe you don't know 
that marketing or operations management is your calling, you can just start in business. It's a general program. You can take different courses before you make your decision where you're like, yes, marketing is the one I want to go with. Or you can stay in business and graduate that way as well. The Faculty of Science is where you'll find more of your traditional sciences. So stuff like astrophysics, neurology, um, plant biology, zoology, all of those sorts of things. The Cummings School of Medicine has two different bachelor programs for undergraduate students. So community rehabilitation and health sciences. I do wanna point out that both these programs are not pre-med programs. They can be really beneficial when going to med school, but you can get into med school from any program. We've had students study dance and get into medical school. So don't put yourself in a box and really study something that you're passionate in. Um, I do wanna point out with becoming School of Medicine that so primarily what they're studying is what health looks like in society, um, how we can use tech to advance that, how can we improve what health looks like in our society in general. And then the Faculty of Nursing um, is a pretty popular program and that's where you would be if you're looking to become an RN. The Workland School of Education has a lot of different options for students, whether you're looking to study elementary, secondary, or K-12 um, students. And so the four-year education degree has a campus-based and a community-based version. Campus-based, you're doing all your studies on campus. Community-based is designed for rural students that are looking to stay in their communities while they study. And eventually when they do their practicums, they're also located in local rural communities where you'll get that practicum experience. Our five-year combined program allows you to complete two degrees at the same time. So maybe you're really interested in kinesiology, but you also want to become a teacher. You can do a Bachelor of Kinesiology and a Bachelor of Education at the same time and complete it in five years. The Schulich School of Engineering is understandably anything engineering related. Um, for first year students in engineering, they all take the same courses, regardless of what they're hoping to specialize in. But after their common first year, they will get to choose which specialty they want to go in into in the following year. And starting this year, it's guaranteed that whichever they choose, they'll get into for their second year. The Faculty of Kinesiology has a couple different bachelors, but if you're considering kinesiology, um, one thing that you should know is that it's actually the number one sports science school in North America. And then also it's anything mind, body, movement, and how all of those things interrelate. We also have other programs requiring previous post-secondary study. We talked about medicine earlier, that's an option. Same with law. But then also I like talking about social work with students because it's it's a popular program. It's also still considered an undergraduate program like the rest we talked about. But you need to complete two years of study in another program or a social work diploma before you apply to finish your two years in the social work program. So it still could work out to four years of study. It's just you need to complete those two years minimum at first. Choosing a program can be really difficult. So you should take advantage of the different things that universities have for you to understand more about their programs and what careers are available when you graduate with their um, degrees. So at the University of Calgary, we have degree profiles available for all of our programs. You can take a look at the career wheel to see more about what career may be best for you and your skills. Then we also have the Choose You Calgary podcast, which is probably my favorite of the options because you actually get to hear from current students, faculty and staff what classes are they taking? What professors do they like? What are they learning in their classes? And then from the faculty side, what are they studying? Um, and what do they like about their careers in that field of study? So what does it look like to apply to the University of Calgary? We do have early and standard admission, um, but it takes place in the same application. You're only filling out one. It really just depends on what, if you're in high school, what courses we're looking at and when we're granting you admission. So if we're looking at early admission, this typically happens before December 15th, and we're primarily looking at your grade 11 grades to determine if we can admit you. Once we pass about December 15th and we're starting to get in your fall grade 12 grades, we're going to start looking at you for standard admission. And then once we receive even more grade 12 grades, we'll look at you again. So you're only filling out one application, 
So don't stress about missing anything. Just apply. Um, let us know your grades. And then if you're from Alberta, we get automatic uploads of your transcripts. And if you're from another province, um, make sure that you stay on top of that. We do have a $125 application fee, but if this is a barrier for you, um, please reach out to me. We can talk about it and maybe see if our application fee waiver program is an option for you. Within our application, you're gonna be able to apply for two different programs. So if there's two programs that pique your interest, make sure you put them both in the same application. There's a first choice and a second choice. Generally, we suggest that students put their first choice program um, as the program that's more competitive. So the higher estimated competitive average and the second choice is more of an alternative. Anytime before March 1st, 2022, which is when our application will close, um, you can change your first choice and second choice programs. Reach out to me and I can help you through that if that's something you need. And the application's already open, so you should apply as soon as possible. Even if you're not done the courses yet that are required for admission, that's okay. Apply as soon as possible. So in general, our general requirements are five program specific um, high school subjects that are gonna be asked for every program. But beyond that, there are a few that have some additional requirements. So the Bachelor of Health Science is an example. It requires a supplementary essay. And then Fine Arts and Dance and Music requires an audition. And Visual Studies in Fine Arts also requires a portfolio. If you're looking at drama in Fine Arts, it doesn't have an audition process. So these are some examples of um, what those five courses might look like. You'll notice that depending on the program, there's a variety of if it's really broad uh, that they're asking you for or if it's really specific. So if we're looking at something that's more broad, the Bachelor of Arts and Law and Society is only looking for English 12. And then the four other courses could really be most things that you're taking in high school. So three approved courses, the approved courses are more like your core subjects. So maybe it's social studies 12 or 30-1, uh, maybe it's chem 30 or bio 30 or science 30. If you're looking at the fifth approved course or option, approved options are typically your electives and they have to be worth five credits. If you took social studies 30-2 here in Alberta, that counts as an option. Gym typically counts as an option, but if you have more specific questions about what approved options they are, please reach out to me or check out our website and it goes more in depth. So if we're looking at a program that's looking for more specific admission requirements, Bachelor of Science in Engineering is a great example of that. It asks for English 12, pre-calculus, calculus, chemistry 12, physics 12, or biology 12. So it's very specific with what students need, and then for any of these programs, the five admission requirements they're gonna ask for, um, those are the only classes we're gonna look at that you've taken to determine what your admission average is. And so you'll see beside all of these examples, there's mid 70s, mid 90s, high 80s, mid 80s. All of our programs are gonna have those estimated ranges available so you can get a good idea of um, where your average might fit or what you wanna shoot for in the coming year. If you're a transfer student, you'd be someone who has completed four or more post-secondary courses. And so instead of looking at your high school average, we're gonna be looking at your GPA, which I'll talk more about in the next slide. And then it's really program and faculty specific. And some faculties ask for just high school courses, some faculties ask for post-secondary courses, and others ask for a mix. So all of this is available on your website, but if you ever have any issues understanding it, reach out to me and we can talk about it and make sure that you've got all the things that you need. So that GPA calculation is gonna come from your most recent 30 units or 10 academic courses. If you've taken less courses than that, but more than four, we'd use whatever amount that is. So this is an example of a more broad um, or it's just looking at a high school subject. It's only looking at English 12, um, and it's, but it's gonna be asking for your estimated GPA to be between 2.6 and 3.0 for a transfer student.
And if we're looking at an example that's much more specific, kind of like the engineering example for high school students, you'll see that transferring into the Haskins School of Business asks for very specific courses. So an English post-secondary course, Math 249 or 265, STAT 213 or 217, Econ 201 and also Econ 203. And it's also asking for a competitive GPA between 3.0 and 3.4. There's also options for adult students. So these are students who are over 21 years of age and they're a Canadian student or a permanent resident. And then they've also completed less than the four courses that we talked about earlier. So if they've completed more than those four courses, they'll still be considered a transfer student. For Indigenous students, there's three alternative pathways that can be, they can be considered under to gain admission to UC. So the most commonly used one is the Indigenous admission process. And this considers you at an alternative admission average. Much simpler to understand, we can boost your admission average to meet the competitive admission average of the program that you're entering. This is probably how I got into school. They probably boosted my average by like 5% and it allowed me to get admission to U of C, it's pretty common and it doesn't change anything about your student experience. So you're just like any other student, we just looked at you with an admission boost. New this year is our Indigenous Admission Supplementary process. So maybe you're missing one of those five required courses that we talked about earlier, or maybe even with the average boost, you're still not competitive enough to get in. You can submit a personal statement or a video that's talking about program specific information. What is your career goal? What are you hoping to get out of the program? Um, maybe why are you missing courses or maybe you had a really tough year. You can explain that and then it will go to an indigenous community within the faculty and they'll be able to determine if they can build a program and support you to be successful and still grant you admission for your first year. Finally, the Indigenous Student Access Program is also an option for Indigenous students. It's a one-year cohort-based program that really builds the foundations for transferring, for transitioning to university. So the only requirement is that you've completed grade 12 English with at least a 65% or higher, and that you've talked to our wonderful ISAP advisor, Reagan. Um, but if you can't meet that 65% or you didn't complete English 12, that's okay. We can also look at a supplementary application. I know that's actually pretty common for many students that get into ISAP. So don't think that um, just because you didn't finish it, you can't be considered because you really can. So in ISAP, you're going to be required to take three post-secondary courses. Two of them are Indigenous Studies, and one of them is an English course. Beyond that, you can take part in upgrading. If that's what you want to do, or you can take other post-secondary courses that interest you. And all those courses that you end up taking will apply to your future program if that's what you decide to continue with in university. All of these admission pathways, and even if you don't think you're going to need to be considered under these, you should self-identify on your application. It will allow us to connect with you to send you Indigenous-specific scholarships and information. And it'll also keep track of you so that when you're graduating, we can invite you to our Indigenous graduation. But if you do get in through one of the Indigenous admission pathways, you will need to provide proof of Indigenous heritage. And so there are options for Métis, Inuit, First Nations status or non-status Indians. And if you don't know what this looks like for you, reach out to me, we can talk through it. Um, there's some pretty broad options that don't just put can I see your status card as the only option? It goes beyond that as well. We understand that university is a big commitment for families. So we provide $17 million in scholarships, bursaries and awards every single year. And so I'm gonna show you guys this chart that really goes through what that means for first year students. So for automatic awards, this, you don't have to do anything extra to be considered for them other than apply to your program. And so if you get in, you'll find out if you want an, an automatic award at the same time. High school entrance awards are a separate application. They come up in your student center a couple days after you apply, and it's gonna be a 15 minute check yes or no question. Highly encourage you to do them. Um, some students don't because they think it's, you know, 15 minutes is a lot of time, but you could win up to $10,000 to go up to go towards your tuition and fees. So it can be really helpful um, for students. 
Prestige awards are our highest valued awards. You can get up to $25,000 a year. The application deadline for that is December 1st. And it's early because the application itself goes to a committee to be considered. And the application itself is more essay-based. It takes a few hours to complete. So it really requires that the committee goes through it longer than just looking at a check yes or no survey. And just like the high school entrance awards, these will pop up in your student center a few days after you apply. These are some examples of our Indigenous student awards, um, but I do want to let you know that just because you're Indigenous doesn't mean you can only apply for these three awards. You can apply for awards that aren't Indigenous specific, and um, there's a lot of them out there, so make sure you look at the criteria, and I'm sure you'll find more that apply to you as well. My contact is indigenous.recruiter at ucalgary.ca. I talked about it at the beginning, but I do take one-on-one -on -one meetings. We can talk specifically about you, help make a plan for you, make sure you're meeting those admission requirements. Um, if you're interested in coming to campus, we can have a one-on-one -on -one tour, we can take you to the Native Center if that's something you're interested in, or look at the specific buildings that um, you're hoping your program's gonna be in or whatever. Or you can just email me your questions. I try to get back to them within a day or two. And I'm usually pretty good at that. But if you guys, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can take yourself off mute and Camila and I would be happy to respond to you guys. When you first apply, is there anywhere like you have to like? Like, where do you declare like your status? The question is in the application itself. I think it's pretty early in the application. And it just asks, do you want to self-identify as Indigenous? And then it asks you if you're Inuit status, non-status, or Métis. Is there a discount code for the application? No, um, not right now. We are working on something. Um, that hopefully you guys will hear about through our website in the next couple of weeks. But if it's going to be a barrier or like application for you to apply, reach out to me, email me at that indigenous.recruiter at ucalgary.ca email, and we can talk about seeing if the application fee waiver is an option for you. Good question though, Kaden. Thank you for your time. Yeah, of course. Thank you for coming, Caitlin. If you guys have any more questions, you can send them to my email. Otherwise, Camille and I are going to sign off for the day. So thank you guys for coming. Thanks, Maya. Thanks, Ty. See ya.